Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Rowing Chat, the podcast for rowers. I'm Rebecca Caro, and this is the podcast that I started in 2013 and is the anchor show in the Rowing Chat Network. It's an interview show format, and today I'm delighted to welcome as my guest, Tony O'Connor. Hi, Rebecca. Hey, Tony, welcome to your first ever podcast with me. First podcast, not not our first chat, though. Correct. Now, Tony, you are, are are the Irishman in New Zealand. You're principally known, or at least most recently known, as being the coach of the Kiwi Eight that won gold at the Tokyo Olympics. So, congratulations and a massive high five. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> But your journey as a as an athlete, you've been an elite athlete. You're a coach. Tell us a little bit about what got you started at the end of an elite career into thinking that coaching might be something that you'd be interested in. Uh, it was a girlfriend, actually. <laughs> Strangely enough, uh, I was I was rowing happily away, and I. Um, was asked could I help out with the, at the time, the Dublin University uh, Ladies Ball Club, Trinity College mm -hmm. Dublin. And I said, of course I could, why wouldn't I? It sounded, exactly. like, a, it sounded like some fun. I, um, I think we had 20, 20 novice girls. And uh, I was right in the middle of my, as you said, my elite career at the time. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And the, I think the next time, that I'd only took, a, I was only a couple of months into the season type thing, but I did enjoy it. Um, a couple of years later, I got injured. I was about maybe 22. So I decided I'd, uh, I'd run some marathons and what better way to do that than rocking down a, a riverbank and, and, and coached a, another bunch of novices from a different university for a year. And I must say, when I went back to rowing, I got myself, my back sorted out eventually, I found a lot of the lessons I'd learned as a, a coach and, um, I could transfer back into 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 what I was actually doing myself in the water, and I think I became a much better rower because of the experience I had as a coach. And I think most years then after that, I, I volunteered to help out every now and again. If there was an opportunity, maybe after a rowing session, and I had a couple of hours to kill, I'd maybe go out with the juniors or offer my services to one of the local schools for a couple of days, and I just thoroughly enjoyed the whole thing. And so. I, I, at the, it was around that time as well, Rebecca, I, I, I switched from, changed careers from being a mechanical engineer to a maths teacher. Oh, and I, okay. I guess the, the whole teaching side of it was in the DNA somewhere. And to me, there was no difference between, you know, teaching, teaching a 15-year-old about the finer points of, of the catch or a 15-year-old about the finer points of, of quadratic equations um so yeah i would think it was just it was just a love of teaching actually it got me into into coaching in the first place the thing that i remember from my very first coaching which was not dissimilar to your own was picking up the megaphone and thinking i was going to say something and then putting it down again because i realized i hadn't got a clue how you had <laughs> to formulate in your mind what you were going to say before saying yeah. it yeah yeah I, I listen i have that experience every week i'm even almost every day um, but you catch yourself very quickly and realize actually what I was about to say is complete rubbish. So I think I'll just keep quiet for a while. And I do, I still do the same. I formulate, um, cause if you listen to coaches, there's an awful lot of rubbish spoken and, and I'm guilty of it as well. And, and I think you, you, as a, as an athlete, you've got to develop a skill of being able to filter out the, the rubbish. So, uh, I learned very, very quickly, like yourself, that if you got nothing good to say, say nothing. There is a thing about the strong, silent coach and some legendary people of our acquaintance who are known to go entire outings without saying anything, which, of course, can lend the wonderful allure that you know so much. But obviously, these athletes are not worthy. <laughs> well, they do hang on. They hang on your every word if that's the type of coach you are. I think. Um, yes, there is a time and a place for that. And but we, we've all had the experience and, and it's like growing as well. You, you've got these wonderful outings that you can't put your finger on why it went so well and and i still remember a couple of outings as a 16 year old um that i can still discuss with the guys i rode with way back then and it's the same as a coach you've got i, I reckon as a coach you've probably got let's say in a seven day week 
I would say two pretty mediocre sessions in you. Um, two pretty mediocre days, actually. Probably about four the reasonably okay days that you didn't really mess up the crew. And then you've got this one wonderful day. So probably one in seven outings, you come up with the magic. And, and if you could tap it, where it comes from, I really don't know. <laughs> I think what, I, what I've learned to do over the years, though, is when, when I surprise myself with something quite um, profound, I have a little notebook and I just used to write that mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. And then I can, I can dig into that. And of course, the athletes, they'll know now, but they never knew that I had a, a notebook up to now. I don't think I've ever told anybody. <laughs> so I'm coming crazy. up with all these great phrases and sayings. And you, and you pick it up off other coaches as well. I mean, if you go out coaching with other people, the, the first thing I reach for is the notebook and sort of very, very quietly sort of scribble down what they've said and, and rehash it a couple of months later and pretend it's my own. The thing is, we forget some of the stuff we previously knew. And I definitely respect your notebook idea because professionally in my you know non-rowing life, they you you come across stuff and you read that and you go, Oh, that's quite good. I might try that again. You know, I haven't done that for a while, or it's uh I'd yeah. I'd change it slightly. But I, I do think that you can't keep everything front of mind all the time. Yeah. No, no, absolutely not. And there are yeah, numerous, numerous sort of uh, examples I've found over the last couple of years, particularly when I'm when I'm coaching two, three times a day, that some something will have been dredged up from somewhere in my past, yeah. and um, and I think why the hell didn't I write that down at the time? And I'm sure we've lost, you know, ninety percent of the good stuff we've said as coaches is, is just lost forever. Um, someone else will come up with them, some other some other. Same with exercises, isn't it? Same with same with drills. I've always said that rowing drills your only limitation is is your imagination mm -hmm. and uh if you can make them fun and exciting and come up with stuff that no one no one else has ever done that's great but um yeah i've, I've done i've done the same as well I've, I, and, and that's why i started taking down exercises as well and drills and put them on an excel sheet years ago and of course it's like it's like an athlete's diary sometimes you're you're you know you're real religious and you'll do it for months and then you'll, you'll skip a couple of days and then you, you'll forget about it for another couple of years again and come back to it and I think we're all guilty of that, really. But yeah, keeping stuff for posterity is good. I must say, somebody who's influenced me a lot is is Steve Fairburn, and yeah. um, I, I think a lot of coaches would would you know advocate reading some of his books, which are well, they're, they're probably a hundred years old now. But yeah. Steve used to write the stuff down all the time. He was a bit of a self propagandist, I think, uh, yeah. from what I've heard about the chap. But um, I'd, I'd really recommend anybody. And I recommended this in a coaching seminar a couple of months ago in Carapiro, that if you're going to read any rowing books, read something by Fairbairn and read some of the sayings. And, and like anybody, he, he, he contradicts himself half the time as well, which only makes it even more fun. But some of the stuff in there is just it's just they're just gems that really are rowing gems. It was one of my very first rowing publishing projects was I discovered that the um, re edited version of his um uh, wrote one of his rowing books edited by his son was coming yeah. out of copyright and um so the kindle edition which is online of uh, complete steve fairburn in four books is published by me and i got permission from <laughs> well copyrights copyright um but we got permission from jesus college cambridge and we paid yeah. them for the right to reproduce the famous portrait of him and yes. so yeah it's very freely available. You don't have to go to an antiquarian bookshop to uh, oh, find copies. Now you tell me. Now you tell me. I, I, I've been doing that for years, tracking down these old books, which go back mm -hmm. to the 1870s and, and paying a fortune for the bloody things. And now you go and tell me this. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about athletes becoming coaches. I mean, you've, you've hinted that you're, you're professionally, you're a school teacher. And so, you know, the teaching, in mm. it was something that, in all likelihood was going to come to the fore with you. But there's certainly a lot of um, glamour around the potential of going on a camp and being coached by an Olympian. Do you think all athletes have it in them to become coaches? I don't think so. I, 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 it's, it's the same as does every student in, in, in secondary school who learns maths have the potential to be a maths teacher? And you can, I don't think so. It's, it's, a, it's a different... It's, it is a different mindset, being a learner and being a teacher. In a lot of ways, though, Rebecca, you, to be a good teacher, you have to be a good learner as well, as I think I alluded to earlier. You've got, you've got to listen and learn uh, from lots of people. It's not to say that you can't learn from athletes as a coach. 
Yeah, absolutely, you can. In fact, you can learn from every single athlete, whether they're an Olympic champion or whether they're a brand new novice in, in the, the Dublin University Ladies Boat Club. Uh, just yes. getting a plug in there. <laughs> but to, to answer your question, um, not everybody can be a teacher, a secondary school teacher, primary school teacher. In fact, some of the teachers I've come across are not even good teachers. Uh, so I think getting the high profile athlete in uh, to do a job which is not rowing, it could be coaching a secondary school for, for a year, it could be um, as, as Mr. Redgrave is doing, being a high, uh, high performance director in China, which he seems to be doing very professionally. Uh, you're taking a bit of a chance because you're asking them to do something that they've never done before and they probably haven't learned the ropes. In, in one way, being an athlete is, in some ways, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. In some ways, it's a lot easier than being a coach. And yeah. um, you do, you know, you, you could say the same. A lot, of, a lot of coaches, a lot of the really, really good coaches in the world have never even rowed to mm. any level. Um, I'm thinking... You know, I'm just thinking of the people I work with in, in Royal New Zealand. Uh, mm -hmm. A number of us have rowed internationally and a number have not. And in fact, James Coote, who coached the women's uh, mm -hmm. uh, double this year who's, uh, and coached the women's lightweight double over the last couple of years, was, was, has barely pulled an oar. Um, but he's a, he's a top-class coach. And I've met many top-class athletes who couldn't explain their way out of a wet paper bag. So, um, yeah, you got to – I think, you know, as – you got to be careful though as, as saying that if you can get a high profile uh athlete olympic medalist to come into your school oh yes they have a they have a different job to do that they, they, they may inspire uh, which a coach with a whole pile of medals may never do um and they can hang you know i've seen that here in in, in christ college uh, where i've worked for years and i'm going back to work with um we've had the the benefit of getting Will Sachin, who of course oh, yeah. the the British eight back in 2016, and Will hadn't done a lot of coaching before. He actually turned out to be a, a bloody good coach, but he himself says he's really been learning on the job. But I tell you what, when Will speaks, the boys listen; they really do um, because he's done it. He's 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 we none of us have got coach, uh, coaches posters on our walls as teenagers. I certainly didn't. They were all rowing. Um, posters. Red, Red Grave was up there and Andy Holmes and, and the Kiwi 8 back in 82, 83. I didn't have you know, God rest his soul, I didn't have Harry Mann up on the, on the wall at the time or didn't have Martin McElroy up on the wall or Jürgen Grove there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's quite interesting though that uh, I I totally understand about the motivation side of things, but also one of the things that is particularly enjoyable about learning to coach is the fact that you've gone back to the bottom again. And yeah. that you realize that you're on a completely different pathway, which, you know, as you say, psychologically isn't suited to everybody. Uh, but you can certainly learn from the war stories and, and telling yeah. stories about what it's like is very, very inspirational. Yeah. Which leads me to you. How on earth did you get on this journey to becoming a Tokyo Olympic rowing coach? Uh, that's... <laughs> yeah it's a bit it's a bit of a story um I'll, right. I'll, I'll take you back to we're, we're not talking about me as an athlete but i'll give you i'll recount my my final race as as an athlete uh I was at the 2002 uh, world champs in seville and i was in the lightweight pair and we and we were the defending world champions and had come into that regatta having won i think most of the races that year but unfortunately i've been sick quite a few times that year and I kept going up and down you know being ill and being good and being ill and being good and my coach at the time uh Tor Nielsen who pretty much taught me everything about this about this game and he had said to me during the year I think you should stop wrong I don't think it's good for you and I thought he was just being stupid I was defending world champion why why would I stop and I intended to go on to Athens and, and do the lightweight four but I ended up getting sick anyway at the World Champs and ended up on the um, on the gurney in the in the the medical centre. And oh. Thor comes over to me and said, "You're a bloody idiot," as usual. And he said, "You're not coming back rowing. I'm never going to coach you again." Hmm. And the next sentence he says, "But I'd like you to coach with me at the national team next season." And so I went from sort of being down there to to being up there straight away. 
And, you know, you talked about war stories. I mean, I went straight two weeks later, I went straight coaching the people I had just rolled with. And that was that was difficult. That was that was that was an experience in itself Um, because they had seen the best of me and they'd seen the worst of me and they knew me. They were my best friends. Um, You know, one of them was my fiance at the time, for God's sake. And um, that was tough. So I found myself magically coaching at the world champs in in 2003 and then coaching at the olympics in 2004 and i'll get to the tokyo journey and i did that and you know we had we had we had a a bunch of pretty inexperienced athletes and we did reasonably well and the obvious choice for me for well for everybody else was well you're gonna you're gonna keep going you can keep doing this and get better and take the crews on and etc etc and I said, no, I, 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 I want to get away from this. I've been doing it for too long, 10 years, 11 years between coaching and rowing. And I wanted to see um, another part of the world and wanted to go back teaching. Um, but in, in a huge way, I, I wanted to go back and almost fill in the gaps in my coaching career that I felt I had, um, I had magically sort of jumped over. Uh, I, I didn't have to go through the juniors or the 23s. I learned my trade. I went straight from being basically an international athlete and a sometime club coach into coaching at the Olympic Games. And I felt guilty about it. And I and I didn't I didn't say this to really anyone at the time except my wife Rachel that I, I wanted just to go back and try and learn the ropes and and almost justify to myself and to everybody else that I did actually deserve to be. A, a good coach at a high level and spent the next uh, that was 2005 when we came out to New Zealand and then I spent the next 12 years coaching with the school mm-hmm. heading up the program we, we moved to Australia and France for a couple of years as well and I coached over there and, and went through some clubs and schools as well um, and yeah I, I, I guess that that itch of going back to the Olympic Games was always there though and as an athlete and a coach, because I'd, I'd made the final as an athlete and, and as a coach as well, but we hadn't, we hadn't won a medal in either case. We were pretty close. And it was always there. And I, I finally decided in 2017 that I, it's getting very itchy, <laughs> this itch, and it needs a good old scratch. So I put my name forward for the junior team, uh, the New Zealand junior team, and, and they saw in their in their... <laughs> infinite stupidness to, to pick me for the for to coach the junior team so i took uh six lads off to the juniors in track i in lithuania that year and in fact two of that four two of the four ended up in the eight in tokyo a couple of weeks ago and did that and we had a we had a great time and i really loved it and, and the boys did well and um uh, shortly after that um alan cotter who was the high performance director at the time and um, Barry Mabbitt, who was uh, the selector, gave me a ring and said, do you want to come up to Auckland just to discuss what you might want to do next? This was probably maybe the end of 2017, start of 2018. So I went up and we met at the airport. And I remember the con- I remember going in saying, right, um, i got to play. I'm, not, I'm not, not a person who really plays hardball a lot, but I thought, to hell with it. I have a chance here. They're obviously interested in something. So they said, hey, look, would you be interested in taking the 23 team next year? And for for those who don't know, the 23 campaign in New Zealand is about, I think it's about maybe three to four months, maybe four months that you you, you relocate to Karapiro. And I couldn't do that with school. I said, I can't do that. I've taken a sabbatical for school. Um, I'm going to have to quit the job and for for 16 weeks. I'm not going to do that. I said, what I actually want to do is coach at the elite level i want to take the crew to the olympic games and the two of them I remember the two of them just sat back and go oh really <laughs> i said yeah i'm just being honest that's i've i've you know i've coached the olympic games before i want to go back to there and i want to try and do a good job and i think i can do a good job this time around and uh, so this they said oh thanks very much <laughs> i thought it was one of those like thanks very much handshakes and we'll, we'll we'll get back to you at some stage and push me out the door but um it was then in just around the time of the Maddie Cup in 2019, um, and we had just finished, and I got a call from Judith Hamilton, who had taken over as High Performance Director. And Judith, in her very forthright manner, said, uh, hi, Tony, it's Judith here. And I knew Judith from, from, from you know, a few years 
And she said, uh, we have an eight here and we'd like you to coach it. So <laughs> That was yeah, easy. Just like that. And she said, you, your job is to qualify for the Olympics. This is 2019. This was April. So we had, what, about three months to go. And uh, I didn't even know who was in the eight at the time. And uh, so I went home and, and, and chatted to, to Rach and the kids uh, who were, how old were they then? Probably, you know, 10, 11 at the time. And they were all said, you, you got to go. You got to go. And, and to be honest with you, I wouldn't have gone if they didn't want me to go because family was the priority. Absolutely. Um, but they wanted me to go. So I packed my bags and a week later, I found myself uh, in front of the boys. <laughs> me, me saying, who the hell are you? And they saying, who the hell are you? And uh, yeah, we, we, we kind of went from we kind of went from there. So, um, yeah, in, in the deep end again. But it's, it, I chose to go to the deep end. I didn't go to the shallow end this time. I went off the 10 meter diving board deliberately. Yeah, so that's how that's how I got to to that stage. Fantastic. So you took them through initially three months to try and qualify at 2019. That didn't happen. No. Um, it was going to be a hard call, you know, a hard, a hard journey to make that happen, I think. Uh, the, <laughs> of course, I knew I knew I said I didn't. Of course, I knew who they were and I knew I'd, I'd coached some of the boys already. And uh, I remember the very first outing, we went out in an eight. And as any coach does coming in, he says, he or she will say, look, I'm not going to say anything this far today. I'm just going to sit back. I'm just going to look. So we got about 500 meters up the lake and I just had to say, whoa, stop. I said, what are you doing? <laughs> because you, you must remember we had, we had people, we had, you know, obviously Hamish had just come back from his cycling mm -hmm. and hadn't rode for sort of two years and had lost you know, he was down to a cycling weight. Maher had come in from the single, so he had his own way of moving. We had a couple of guys who had come up through the under 23, um, eight from back in 2013, 2014. And then we had a couple of young juniors in. Matt McDonald was there, who was only 19 at the time. And mm -hmm. there was guys stopping at the finish, and there was guys meeting them halfway up the slide, and there was guys whacking it in as hard as they could, and guys being so gentle. And I remember sitting there having a, a, a conversation, just said, look, the first thing in rowing, I think we all need to know is we need to do it together. <laughs> I literally said that. And uh, all the boys looked at me and I went, yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. <laughs> so we had, to, we had to break it down. And I think that first three months, and I think actually the next year as well, uh, through 2020, it was a case of breaking it back down to first principles, deciding on what we wanted to do. Not so much what I want to do. Well, I mean, I, I, I have a certain philosophy on how boats move, but it's, it's quite fluid and quite flexible based on the natural movement of the athletes themselves. I never believe in, in saying my way is the correct way because there's so many way, different ways of doing it. I think what you got to do is I had to look at basically what's the middle ground and what's the easiest thing for everybody that will still result in a boat moving quickly. And, um, and I've always found it, it's taken me personally a year to two years to sort of instill that into sort of stamp my philosophy and stamp my, my mark on a crew. So that first three months, we had a lot of ups and we had a lot of downs. We had some really, really good races and we had some shocking races and shocking training spins. And um, I think the result at the Worlds was disappointing in, in that we probably could have qualified. We came yeah. sixth, but we were point, I think we we're point three or point two off the American, we were only two seconds off winning a medal. But at the start of that week, Steve, our, our stroke man at the time, Steve Jones had, I, I, um, and I'm not, it's not Steve's fault. I think, you know, we, we could have rode better in here, but, but Steve had a little bit of a, an incident in, in which he sort of keeled over at, at 12 o'clock at night in the, in the hotel room the day before the heat. Oh. And um, still don't quite know what it was, but lucky enough, myself and the doctor were there and, Steve, you know, he was vomiting and he was from, from everywhere. And um, he certainly wasn't himself the next day. We just paddled down the heat and, and he started to get better as the week went on, but it did knock a lot about him, out of him. And it, it knocked a lot out of the crew and the fact that we couldn't actually race and learn from racing at the World Championships. And we ended up, and we ended up just having a, a pretty bad start at, on, on the, in the final. The rest of the race was quite good, actually. We were pretty much the same speed as everybody. So there was certainly potential. But I tell you what, I, I really do believe that if we had qualified at that um, world champs, we wouldn't be having this conversation today, you and I, as Olympic gold medalists. Um, 
we, so you're saying the uh, the hard path, the 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 rough road was part of the requirement for that crew. Oh, absolutely, and and not just not just you know health wise with Steve, etc. I think we all had to look at ourselves, myself included, and the boys, and look at um, and of course I I was starting to learn about some of the stuff that had gone on previous and getting to know the boys themselves and what made them tick, and it was quite raw actually, and the the whole project almost came to a halt at that stage because Royal New Zealand really haven't got a history of sending crews to the um, final qualifier in Lucerne. Correct. Uh, they've done it before and crews haven't performed over there. Um, mm -hmm. And I had to, I remember flying home from Austria and I couldn't sleep. I was quite upset and uh, literally taking going through all the times of all the races and and working out that in fact the men's eight that our our eight which came sixth percentage wise was was closer to a medal closer to qualifying closer to a gold medal than even some of the crews and the new zealand team who had qualified and won medals that in fact okay we didn't qualify but we were bloody close and so i, I worked out all the stats and drew some fancy graphs and uh and and wrote a speech and uh as soon as I got home, I, I sent that information back into anyone who would listen, anyone who counted, you know, high performance mm -hmm. directors, coaches, CEOs, and said, hey, look, I really believe in these guys. Um, yeah, we stuffed up slightly, but I, I, you know, I think we've been doing this long enough. Just, just give us another year. And uh, I think I almost said, trust me on this. I, I do see a lot of potential. And... Um, yeah, in, in their wisdom, and, and, and I'm really thankful for this because it was a, it was a step outside the norm for Royal New Zealand to say, we will support you, and we will support um, all these guys as well. It wasn't just eight at the time. We had 14 guys going for this, um, and the financial consideration, and uh, so it showed a lot of trust from, from them as well. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we went through that because I said to you, we had to, we had to pair everything right back uh, physiologically, technically, um, but most of all, Rebecca, we actually had to instill or look for a a better culture in the team. And on, when I talk about the team, I talk about the the, the men's team. Um, we were, I think, quite rightly compared to the women's team, who had been very, very successful last year with um, four gold medals, and and we were looked on in some ways as the poor relation. And in some ways, we did deserve that. In some ways, we didn't deserve that. Um, and it certainly spurred us on that sort of comparing ourselves to the girls in positive and negative ways for the next year and a half. Um, again, we wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for the girls. They were our, they were sort of our shining light on the hill. And that's what we had to aspire to, not just prognostically on the water, but actually just everything they did in the gym and everything they did in terms of nutrition and, and just their whole demeanor. And um, I think over the next, you know, through 2020, into lockdown and, and back into 2021 that that really it grew that that whole culture of the, of the men's team grew and i know it's a bit of a cliche to talk about culture but um it made a huge difference that that positivity and that that honesty uh i think the honesty between the members of the team myself and the, and the team and between the team members themselves was huge we had quite a few pivotal discussions arguments tears shouting matches that needed to happen and um i don't know whether they might have happened in the past but they certainly we, we got quite good at them we got really good at those things and did you lead that personally or did you have you know a sports psych sitting at your elbow um we we we, we have a full range of people in, including sports psych who jason was our sports psych who's, who was bloody brilliant um, but I think we, we had our peripheral, I'll call it peripheral, we have our tight team, but the, the, the core of that is the coach and the athletes. And mm -hmm. then the core of that is actually the athletes themselves. So I, I'm a great believer in teaching the, teaching the rower or teaching the student to teach themselves. So I guess in a lot of ways I guided and tried to lead that, but there were certainly a, quite a number of very, very strong personalities in the team who, and some of them came in in 2020, 20, not even, weren't even there in 2019. So we had Tom McIntosh came in uh, from the 23 team. Uh, Tom was only 22 and he had never won a senior medal before. And I remember Tom 
coming to me before and says, I really feel I need to talk to these guys, but who am I to say anything? Because I've never done anything. I've got a couple of under 23 medals, but I'm, I'm, I'm about to have a go at guys who've won Olympic medals here and have won world medals. And um, I said, Tom, do you feel you've got to do it? And he said, yeah, I've got to feel I've got to do it. So he did. And uh, his standing within the group was just, it, you know, it, it, everybody respected Tom, but because he actually got up and he said what he thought. And that he found that very difficult initially. Um, so we tried to, or certainly I tried to, and we tried to encourage each other to do that. Tom Murray was another one. I mean, Tom was one of our, our stellar athletes, double, double medalist in the pair over the last few years. But Tom, and he won't mind me saying that, is quite an introverted chap. He, 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 he talks by his actions rather than his words. Um, so when Tom actually talks, everybody listens. And, and, and it's almost a bit scary. And I did, I did tell Tom a couple of times, hey, Tom, listen, when things are actually even going well, you've got to every now and again pick your moment and actually just harp on at the boys or just give a bark or shout at them because they will listen to you more than they'll listen to me. So I guess it, it was trying to find everybody's, um, you know, qualities and try to bring them out. And I guess that's part of what your coach does. It's not just teaching how to put the oar in the water and pull. Um, you know, we had quite, we had guys who were 19, 20 years old. We had guys who were 30, 42 years old. And you're coming from completely opposite ends of experience, and even even the way they speak. I mean, you know, we had three guys: James, Bondi, and 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 Mahe, and then Steve joined in with 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 a baby as well. So after training, when some of the boys would want to stay and discuss this, they'd have to come and change nappies. And and the young guys just didn't get that, and the old guys just didn't get the young guys who were on bloody Snapchat and Twitter half the time. So that was that was, you know, trying to juggle those type of people, all all A one personalities. That was that was just a blast. That was great fun. <laughs> he says, "He's the man who likes a challenge." And and obviously, you know, the the maths teacher coming to to the fore as well with yeah, sticking yeah. your neck out personally, um, and then asking the athletes to back you, having yeah. stuck your neck out to get basically keep them their jobs for another year. Yeah, yeah. Let's go uh, on to the. Go on. No, no. So you're, you're, no, you. I'm just going to say that's, that's, that's a trust thing, Rebecca, um, yeah. and it's, a, it's a knowledge, and you've got to, you've got to know who you're working with, uh, so you can put your dreams in their hands, and that goes two ways. That's, that's me getting to know the athletes, and to know what makes them tick, uh, because I want to be there just as much as they do. And they got to they they had to learn to know me over the years the, the the two years I was there with them, and yeah that that's hard to sort of expose yourself every now and again and actually show the real you because if you don't, um, they're not going to trust you when it comes to making those really really hard decisions. And you, you mean you talk about the maths teacher, uh, the the real maths teacher came out maybe four times over the two years, and when it did. Um, the boys still talk about it, <laughs> and you know, I, I, I'm pretty easy going, but there, there were a couple of times I did. I won't say I lost it, but um, I, I certainly told them what I thought and what needed to be done, and, and you know, they did it because I think we had grown to that point that we had seen who we were, were deep down, not just as a coach or a rower, somebody who does 545 and an argue. I've actually I've seen, I think I've seen nearly all those guys in tears at one stage, and they've certainly seen me um in the same situation as well so yeah time time as a coach is is for me personally was really important to, to get to know people talk us through some of the seating decisions you made you you've already mm. told us there were 14 guys in the squad um how did how did the key seats get allocated you've got bow pair stern pair you've got the big middle four and yet we've all seen racing lineups that were significantly different over those two years, three years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, probably about. So we were we were I'll, I'll just jump forward a bit. We were selected as a crew uh, in trials, which were our trials were in March, I think. Men's trials were in March and we went out, we put an eight out in the water and it raced down. It did quite well. And I didn't say this to our selectors, our Judith, our high performance director, but we had made the decision as a, as a, as a team that we w were not happy with the seating, that, that maybe, maybe there was a better seating um, 
configuration to be found. And now that we knew who the eight guys were, because before that mm. we had, you know, lots of people. Um, and I said a day, I said, look, we're going to spend three weeks. I spent 21 days and we're going to try everything. Oh. And be because uh, I have a few ideas, which I think might work. And some of the boys had a few ideas. I said, let's try it. And it's something I personally, uh, as, as a coach, and I've, I've, I've always advocated. And because there's over, you know, with, with bow side and with tandems and with all sorts of stuff, there's, I think there's over 2,000 ways you can rig a boat. <laughs> but unfortunately, we didn't have 2,000 outings to work with. Um, and you talk about the, the big four in the middle. Phil Wilson, uh, who was, who's only, I think I'm taller than Phil. Phil was in the sixth seat. And um, I, a Bondi at one stage was talking on, on TV recently, and he said he thought everybody had probably rode in every seat at some stage over the last two years. And honestly, that's probably correct. We tried triple tandems, double tandems, single tandems, bow side strokes. Um, and it, it, yeah, it, it all had, we didn't, it wasn't pure, it wasn't panic. Now, I, I, I said to you, you know, I didn't tell the high performance director we we're doing this, but Judith called me into the office at one stage. She said, oh, um, we're just a little bit concerned and, and the selectors are concerned that you haven't seemed to have settled on the crew. And I said, no, we settled on the crew, all right. We just haven't settled on where they're going to sit. And she said, oh, do you not think it'd be good just to let them? And I said, no, I don't. I said, I actually don't. I've done this for years. Um, I do believe in any crew, whether it be four and eight big crews, there is this magical seating which can actually gain you more um more distance i don't think that that magical seating can last forever i think it's got a lifespan so i don't believe in, in picking a crew months before and it's going really well and just leaving it there i think people change and as they change you've got to move and and you know put them where actually where they're comfortable and what makes the boat go, go quickly so the underlying the underlying thing with, with where we see to them was do you feel comfortable there um, right, right. and 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 we'd ask each of the boys that and then all the other boys would say yeah it feels better with x in the two seat or y in the bow seat etc cetera, etc cetera. um the the final you know we we picked a we picked a, a, a seating that uh i'll get, tell you the story about the seating in a minute but we picked a seating for the qualification regatta, and that was the end of our three-week period, and it went really well. Everybody was happy. Matt was up in the stroke seat. Uh, Tom Mack was in the seventh seat, and uh, Bondi was back in two. Bondi ended up, and he was in two in 2019 as well, because we did try, we literally did try, I tried him in the stroke seat. That's the obvious thing. Oh, you have to try mm -hmm. Hamish. And Hamish himself thought that that's where he'd go, and he just couldn't do it. He, he just thought, he was just, he said himself he was just appalling. And the boat went slower and slower, and he was trying to row it like a pair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So eventually, we gave up on that, and we chucked him back the boat. And in fact, I think the first time we chucked him back in the two seat was two days before the Grand in Henley in 2019, which we ended up winning. And uh, we thought, okay, <laughs> because we tried him in the six seat at stages, and the further we went back, the better he became. Funny enough, yeah. so we, we tried him in six, five on stroke side, obviously with a different rig, and 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 you could see it the further he went. What, what what it was about, you know, the, the run of the boat or the hide off the water or just the freedom of being in the two seat or being able to bark at everybody else in front of him because he likes that. But he, the, the two seat was natural. And he said, hey, this is this is where I'd like to sit. So there was really no question of him going anywhere else. We, every now and again, we chuck him somewhere. But um, a lot of people were surprised like, about that. I heard it on the commentary, I think, on the BBC. Why, why is your most experienced? Why is the 22 year old in the stroke seat? Well, the 22 year olds in the stroke seat because he was very, very good at it. Yes. Um, so we put this crew out for, for the qualification regatta. We came back and I remember being out a couple of weeks later. So this was between the qualification and going to um, Tokyo. I remember, I remember the name of the place. I was going to call it Athens there for a minute. Um, and I was looking at Sean Kirkham, who was in the three seat. Now, Sean has always rode in the three seat. He prides himself on just going back and pulling as hard as he can um you know the big the big ergo man the big grunts and mm -hmm. it was a spiritual home and even if you moved him to two or four he was a bit uncomfortable but i was looking at sean and thought and i said to sean and this is in front of everybody I said sean that's the best rowing i've ever seen you do and he was and he got you know he was really pleased with that obviously 
the next day, Tom Mack, who had been in the sevens, he um, hurt his wrist and he was going to be out for a few days. So I think, oh, Sean, you get up there in the seven seat. So mm -hmm. Sean hops up into this. is, I mean, this is entirely due to T-Mac's wrist injury. Um, and T-Mac had been actually a little bit out of time as well. He's very, very quick in his legs. He's very, very, you know, he's, he gets it in and gets it on really, really sharp. Um, so there was this sort of discrepancy in the movements, which didn't slow the boat down. It was just one of those things. But I said, we'll chuck Sean in there. So Sean hops in the seven seat and goes really well and matt in the stroke seat said he's actually going really well i quite like what he's doing yeah. um so i think well yeah, i might try that and of course i had to tell tom that hey tom we're going to put you back the boat somewhere um wow. so i tried him in, i tried him in three sean's seat and that was fine the boat was going a little bit better and but then bondy says oh, i can't I find it difficult to follow tom he's coming back at me a little bit too quick here so i thought what what will we do and the obvious thing was to maybe try him in the bow seat and uh, Tom Murray was in the bow seat and he said, I'll try the three seat, that's fine. So everybody was fine with it, except I hadn't told Tom Mack. So I ring, I ring up Tom Mack, who was recuperating at home. And the way I put it to him was I said, hey, Tom, if you were to pick a crew, if you were to pick an eight, who are the two most important people, stroke side and bow side? Where would you put them? And he went, oh, yeah, probably the stroke would be the most important man. Pick him. And then obviously the bow man, he's really important. I went, Good man, Tom. I'm going to put you in the bow seat. <laughs> so he, he kind of, I could hear him thinking for a second. He said, oh, yeah, fair enough. That'll do. Yeah. And he didn't say, he, so he didn't say, it's, it's not a call. trick question. <laughs> yeah. So Tom still thinks to this day that he made the call. Um, but funny enough, but by putting him in the bow seat, it sorted out his discrepancy. He actually started moving really well. And huh. Sean was good in the seven and the boat just picked up speed. And um, this was only three weeks out from the games. Yeah. And it was just inadvertently we had to try something because Tom wasn't in the boat that day. So I think it's a lesson learned that. Um, and I think every coach has had that experience. The stroke man's not there one day. So they choke someone in from the reserve boat and does much, much better. <laughs> well, it, it, you you probably may not know this, but there is New Zealand rowing legends of the 1972-8, who before you were the last men to win an Olympic gold medal. And Tony, oh, I'm struggling to remember the name Tony of the man Brooke. in the boat. Thank you. Tony, uh, Tony Brook, yeah. No, Tony Brook was too seat. Um, the, their stroke man, also called Tony. Oh, uh, Tony Hurt. When, Tony Hurt in 72. Yeah, yeah Brooke was uh, 1981. Um, Tony Hurt went into the stroke seat in very similar situation he was subbing in for somebody who was sick or injured or away and everyone came off the water apparently after that outing and went we found our stroke and right. he was never right. anywhere else and Rust rusty robinson claimed he was going to do it all along <laughs> well and why wouldn't you that's what good coaches do of course no but that's 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 the, that's the art of i mean as i said there's two thousand different ways of doing it and, and I, I still guarantee you we still didn't stumble upon the right way doing it but I, I do think it's really important that you're you're open to flexibility and open to change and go with your gut sometimes. And um, sometimes it can pay off. Certainly, there are a few truisms, one of which is it's been extremely handy in my personal experience, which is to treat your bow pair as your emergency reserve stern pair. Yeah. Because something happens or you move from year one to year two or year two to three, and you find that you can then flip them and get a completely different crew, still moving well, you know, still taking over the role. And a new challenge is often fun for an athlete, as long as, as you say, they're open-minded to experiencing. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's a di sometimes it's, it's almost a different sport being in the bows of the boat or the stern of the boat. And, and I think that's one of the things I've liked to – don't over, do over the years with with cruises is, is to change them even if you don't need to change them change them anyway because it gives it gives the athletes a good perspective on what their teammates have to do um you know the the first if the boat dips onto stroke side the stroke man is the first guy always get to get caught same yep. on bow side with the seven man and if you're back down in the two and three seat you'll never know that so you suddenly you get this idea hey rather than just rowing my seat i'm actually i'm trying to make it easier for everybody else to row to their potential as well and that's one way to do it is to swap people around, yeah. Now, you very nearly got to Tokyo in, in your story. Um, yeah. I don't really want to know about all the COVID protections, but I'm sure that they were extremely onerous. Mm. 
you got there and raced your heat and it didn't you didn't manage to emulate the girls who qualified straight through to the final mm. uh what actually happened i guess we we hadn't yeah the, the, the first i'm very glad we went through the rep i think almost like i'm very glad we didn't qualify back in 2019 is one of those key moments and um I, I did did remember telling the boys after that that you don't have to, or even before it, actually it was before I said, you know, in some ways going through a rep anyway is not a bad thing because you can put some mistakes to bed, particularly as we hadn't raced, all, apart from the, the qualification regatta when we did one race, we hadn't raced at all in two years. So sometimes that extra race is quite good. Um, would I rather win the heat? Of course you would as a coach. You always like to see your athletes beat everybody else. And uh, the, 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 the boys went out. They went out in pretty good spirits. But, you know, when we looked at it afterwards, um, the, the, the 250 from 250 through to 500 was, was just scratchy. If, if I think every, every athlete and every rower knows what that word means. Um, I don't think we came below 40, 41 through the whole race and I said to the boys look good result we came second we're just behind the Dutch who we know are a very good crew um let's have a chat tonight no so not straight after let's just go through a warm down and let's let's meet up tonight when we're all relaxed and we've all thought about it a little bit put a bit of distance and in the meantime I rang home and I talked huh. to Rachel I rang I, I talked to Rachel my wife and uh Rachel Rachel's coach Rachel was an international rower herself and has won champ Irish championships and New Zealand championships and she's coached as well national uh, schools winning crews so she knows a lot and I said what did you think and she said now nah, you, you didn't settle properly your, your second 250 was pretty crap and I said I know um so that's how I started off the discussion with the boys that night I said my wife thinks you were crap from 250 to 500 um and they agreed they said yeah it was just scratchy it wasn't one of our better roles we didn't really settle so I said, right, um, I can't remember what day that was. We, we raced the final on the Friday. So it possibly the when, yeah, it was the Wednesday because Monday, Tuesday were called off. Oh, no. So um, we, we, could, we could row on Tuesday. Um, so we went out for a row the day after the heat. And, I, and, and this is one of those school, school master moments. And I said, right, I'm going to go back to what I know. And you guys are basically going to listen. We're going to do 12 kilometers, and this is what we're going to do. So we gave him, I gave him two exercises to do. And I can mostly tell you what the exercises were. There's no, no stage secret. It was basically row along and, and bow pair initially, then three, four, then five, six, then. So in, in pairs, they just keep the blade on the feather, and they just go up to the catch, and they come back to the finish, and they go up to it. So they don't put the oar in the water. They're just sliding. Mm -hmm. So all they're doing is trying to get the movement of the boat and the movement of the rhythm without tensing up before the entry. Because one of the things we did identify was the boys were a little bit too tense. They didn't let the boat run underneath them and they were a little bit too aggressive coming into the usual stuff. Um, you do so good work, but let the boat work as well. And they just didn't let the boat work. So that exercise just helped them relax coming into the catch. And then we turned around and came back down. We did some of the old the old fashioned, good old fashioned slap the blade as hard as you can on the water. Slap catches, don't you yeah. love it? And the serious slap catches, not to just to tip it, but hit it, try to break the oar. Oh. Um, because that basically tires out the shoulders as well and makes you more relaxed and, and fluid. So we did that. And then we did four 20 stroke pieces. And they were what I call decelerating pieces. So we went off at 42. And at 10 strokes, the cocks would, would give a call and we'd had to hit 38 within two strokes. And we would stick at 38 and that was religious you had to do it we did four of those and they went really well and the boat speed was really good so the discussion that night before the before the before the rep was boys we've discovered our rhythm we hadn't lost it we had lost it for one day basically but it was really good that we had lost it because now we could reiterate it and say this is this is what makes this boat go quick and one of the boys was quoted in the papers after saying we had to live or die by this rhythm. And that's exactly the words we use. He said, look, if you do what you did today, you're not going to win. If you do what we did today in training, you might win. So let's let's go with that. And they did that in the rep. They went off and, yeah, the Brits had a really good start. But the boys sat 38. In fact, they hit 36 and a half at one stage. 
and went straight through everybody. And I think once they came off that rep, um, the confidence was there to say, actually, we, we didn't forget how to row. Um, well, we did for we did for five minutes, 22, but um, that's what we'll do in the final. And again, no worries. We're just going to do exactly what we did in that rep, find our rhythm. And in fact, in the final, um, the, the call Sam was going to make, the Cox was stride, real old fashioned, stride out. Yeah. And we would we would call stride twice one to come from you know 47 down to 42 and then the next stride was 42 down to 38 but of course it's the olympic final so sam had to call it three times and was even considering it a fourth but lucky enough the boys hit the i think they were 38 and a half 39 and um yeah the rest is history as they say so that that, that was a key moment that losing so we learned more from losing than we did from if we had won that that heat well yeah. congratulations tony that's it, a, an incredible story, but also it really illustrates to me how you need to be so on your toes and to try and pull the physical and the mental together. You can't let the team fall apart mentally. You have to give them confidence. Selecting those drills was really interesting because those are um, what one of my old coaches used to call fluffing drills. You know, they're technical. They're, you know, they're, they're not... Uh, the sort of drills that you would expect to be doing just before no. an Olympic final. No, no, very true. Yeah, yeah, you got You got a bag of tricks, and sometimes you got to you got to delve down to the bottom of that bag of tricks. Do things. I like the slaps exercise. We hadn't done that in, I would say, six to eight months. Yeah. Um, but it, it, you know, the, 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 it, it was needed. Something was needed, and that's that's the thing that that helped, I guess. Uh, but 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 the the most important thing was I guess not so much the exercises but that everybody just agreed that we're going to do something and we're absolutely going to stick at it. And I think one of the things I said to the boys was be one of those crews that crosses the line and hasn't got a clue where they came. And you've got to look up at the scoreboard to see how. And if you look at the re if you look at the reactions of some of the boys after they some of them certainly did that they hadn't a clue hadn't a clue they won. <laughs> Some of them did. Some of them knew about a thousand meters into it. But that reflects that, that wonderful bag of divergent personalities that you were already working with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, a special, a special journey and actually a really, really special bunch of guys as well. It was it was a real privilege to work with them for it was only two years and a couple of months, but it was it was very special. One of the things my husband, who's a coach and spots these things that I don't spot, he was watching in the third 500 and he just said, the Germans have lost their confidence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the pundits going into an Olympic regatta, I count myself as one of them. You'd, we had very little to go on. We'd seen the European crews had raced. Everyone knew the Antipian crews had not raced or hadn't raced in public. We didn't yeah. know much about relative boat speeds but certainly the german eight was the crew to beat you know they had a track record to an envious track record and then all of a sudden doubt seemed to have crept in in that third 500 which was where the new zealand crew really stamped their names on the race they they weren't leading at the first marker post they were yeah. leading at the hardest point in the race they took the race away from the other two medalists. Yeah, I I, I heard um, Sean Kelly. Do you remember Sean Kelly? He was a Irish professional cyclist back in the seventies and eighties. And he uh, Sean Kelly to me. I mean, he talked about posters on the wall. Sean Kelly was on my wall, and he was number one cyclist in the world for for you know five or six years. And he always said that the best time to attack was when everybody else is buggered. And he used those words. You know, when you're three quarters of the way up the hill and people are looking, you know, they're, they're maybe taking a break. That's the time to turn the screw. Um, and so if you can do it, that third 500, yeah, it's, um, there's an old saying, the third 500 is one before Christmas. And I, I really do think that's the, that was the case with our boys. We had the mountain singles for three months before Christmas and, um, it didn't surprise me when they pushed. Once they found the rhythm, um, the rhythm was was actually deadly when they did it well. Uh, so it didn't surprise me to, to see that. Not that I actually did see them, Rebecca. I didn't even watch the race, but 
when I watched the replay, <laughs> it didn't surprise me. So where were you when the race was happening? I don't watch rowing races. I just, I, I can't. I've schoolboy schoolgirl races i just I, if, I, if i'm down in twizel in the south island new zealand i'll hide behind a tree uh if i'm in carapir i'll hide behind a chip van um i i it's funny i they i pushed the boys out and then i lost it of course and tried to find some place but you can't escape the olympics at the olympics there's screens everywhere and you can hear the commentary going and i, I walked out the back of the boat the boat bays and i saw gary hay doing the same yep. thing because he was the women's eight was out at the same time and and we kind of looked at each other and went oh yeah <laughs> um so i found i found a little spot in the boat weighing tent boat weighing area and there was a couple of very nice japanese people there just waiting for a crew to come in and so i i, I, I but i the problem is i couldn't i couldn't see a screen but i could hear the commentary going so <laughs> i literally put my fingers in my ear like that and started to, and i could hear the guy saying attention go and right. I, I, I did that and I started counting from zero <laughs> and I figured it was going to take me, what, 320 seconds to get to the end I'm of the gonna, road. Yeah. <laughs> You've got a pretty good idea as to how long you're going to have to count. Yeah. Um, so I got to, I mean, you lose all track of time and speed, etc. So I got to about 180 and I saw Mike Roger, who's, who's Emma Twigg's coach. And Mike was kind of shuffling, half running with his hands up in the air like that. And I thought, oh, hang on, something must be happening. <laughs> and um, I, I, I took the fingers out of the ears and uh, just made it down to the water to see the boys cross over the line. The, the, even the Germans hadn't even crossed the line. So I literally got their last stroke of the Olympic final. And um, that was, yeah, it was a bit of a shock, actually. <laughs> but, but I couldn't watch it. There's no way I was going to watch it. Oh, my God. Yep. You, you're going to hope you're not that parent when the child goes, Daddy, did you see me dive? And you have to go, yes, honey. Well, do you know, it's funny you should say that, but today my, my eldest, Grace, who's 13, she signed up for rowing in school. So <laughs> I've got another five years at least ahead of me. <laughs> Just don't yeah, get drawn into it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't well, coach your own child. I think that's, that's rule number yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, I might take you up on that <laughs> recommendation. Tony, it's been a delight having you here on Rowing Chat. Thank you so much for sharing just those amazing insights of the inside track of a very special crew taking a very unusual path because I'm sure some statistician will tell me that no one has ever won the Olympic gold medal after qualifying at the last chance regatta. But your role and taking the guys with you on a journey and the symbiosis of the coach plus the athletes has produced something that I know is going to be a legendary story that will live on. Tony O'Connor, thank you. Thank you.